Go for it. Okay, so um, this is a video introducing flexible nasal endoscopy. Uh, it's one of the most commonly um, performed ENT procedures, and essentially all of the uh, new intake and all of the new ENT SHOs uh, will become confident and, and competent at doing it because we, we, we actually use this procedure in the majority of patients that we see, um, both acutely and also uh, electively in clinics. So it's something that's worthwhile using and, and use it for the majority of diagnosis of, of any pre presentation to, to ENT, especially at, at an urgent basis. So um, we'll just show you the, the scope here. So this is the flexible nasal endoscope. Um, this is usually kept in a uh, surgery center or on brook ward, and it would be in a <clears throat> sealed plastic uh, container rather than, than the suitcase. Uh, but it comes with a scope on its own and essentially nothing else. Um, what you will need to bring on the, uh, with you um, and take with you is uh, some lubricant jelly, uh, some, a pack of swabs, and an alcohol stirrette as well. So uh, once you've got um, all the equipment you need, so you've got the scope, um, you've got the jelly, the alcohol stirrette, and a swab with some tissue to put the jelly on. Uh, make sure you also find the light source. That uh, comes on a, uh, it's quite a big light source, and it comes on a um, trolley as well. And you can use the trolley. It looks like that. Uh, the one you use on the ward uh, will be on a metal trolley, and it's a, a red and white box on the bottom. And it's quite handy because you can use that, um, use the trolley that it comes on to also carry the scope and rest of the equipment as well. So, <clears throat> and with the light source itself, so it's of course demonstrating, first you turn it on and then you can change the brightness uh, on it. Um, again, all light sources might look different, they all have very similar sort of basic function con and controls. Um, so, let's turn that off for now. So, onto the scope itself. Um, so, this is this is the flexible and main endoscope. Um, Essentially, this is the thin end here. This is the part that's uh, used to examine the patient. And the longer, thicker lead is the light lead, the end of which is here. Um, there are different adapters on the light source itself, so you don't need to source uh, an adapter for here. And you can rotate, and we'll show you on the light source where you can rotate that to find the right setting. Usually, it's already left on the right setting for all the scopes that we have um, that we use sort of acutely, so you don't need to change it. Onto the scope itself. Um, this is the eyepiece, as you can see here. Uh, this is to control the focus. And we'll show you what sort of in and out of focus, you, you obviously will know. Um, I'm going to show you that on the camera later. And this is the control here, the finger control, which adjusts the angulation of the tip there. Okay? Um, and there's different ways of holding it. You can hold it this way with the finger control up, so the patient is facing us. Uh, with, and you can so just show you show your grip, how you're gripping it. Yeah, so, so you're gripping it so... The way I do it is that you see this light lead coming across here. I grip it so uh, with my thumb underneath the eyepiece, fingers across the light lead, and then using the finger control at the top, using my index finger to control it. Other ways of gripping it are basically the, the inverted way, or the other way, um, with the finger control at the bottom. Um, yeah. the, the other way, again, eyepiece facing yourself, but the, the finger control pointing downwards. Um, and doing it like this, like using your thumb rather than your index finger to control the angulation of the tip of the lens. Okay, so there's two ways. Just practice both of those and see which feels more comfortable and natural to you. Okay. All right. Right. So now you've got all the equipment by the bedside. Um, explain to the patient what you're going to do. Um, that you're using a small camera through the nose to have a look at the back of the nose, down the throat, and all the way down towards the voice box as well. Um, show them the. the uh, the tip of the camera, and also explain to them that the, not the entire uh, the fiber optic um, camera is going to go in, there's about half of it that's needed. Okay? Um, explain to them that it takes between 20 and 30 seconds. Um, it can be slightly uncomfortable, but it shouldn't be painful. Um, they might be asked to do a few tasks during it, but they're all very simple. Um, if it does become painful, they should let you know, and then you can stop the procedure. It may bring a tear to the eye, but that's entirely to be expected. Now that you're at the patient that's how you've explained to the patient they uh, consented you to go ahead with the procedure um, get the scope out make sure you plug it into the light source and that it goes all the way in okay and then check there's good illumination uh, coming out of the tip and you can put it on some uh, anything white to show that it is lighting up sufficiently one of the reasons for uh, poor illumination is that one the light source has not been plugged in far enough okay so now that you've uh, got the consent of the patient to go ahead with the procedure, you can set up to, to start. Um, so get the end of the light lead and um, insert it into the light source. Turn it on. 
and make sure it's at maximum brightness and just check either on your hand or uh, on the gauze itself. Just slow down a little bit so and that we can actually see that. Oh yeah, so check in your hand that there is a good light amount of light coming uh, coming through. If it's very dim or it seems very poor, uh, poorly illuminated, there's a few reasons for this. One is that the light source, uh, the light lead, beg pardon, has not been plugged uh, fully um, and inserted fully into the light source, so make sure that's the case. And number two, uh, make sure you're using the right adapter and that will allow you to um, insert it properly. Um, occasionally the light lead itself can be broken, although that's relatively rare, so check those uh, common areas first. Okay, so now that you've got good illumination, have a look through the camera at some written words. So usually we use the packet on the jelly tube to make sure that you're getting a clear image and able to read the writing. If you're able to see that, then that's in focus. If it's out of focus, you can adjust this here to the, the diopter of, of your own vision. Okay. So um, at this stage, now that you know that the camera is in focus and there's a good illumination, um, you have to lubricate the uh, tip of the camera itself. So you use that by uh, putting in some lubricant jelly. Um, the way I do it is just essentially putting the tip, but not the actual lens itself in the jelly and rolling it slightly so you cover the entire circumference of the lens and then using the alcohol stirrette and then rubbing the lens itself directly onto the stirrette so that you demist the lens. Okay? The other way to demist it is asking the patient to stick the tongue out and then rubbing it on a bit of saliva that, that, that also works. And now you're ready to do the scope. Okay. Yeah. Alright, do you want to do the scope? So Sorry. when you're doing it, there's a couple of ways. Like my grip's very similar to that of Sean now. Um, when we do it, make sure that this is in a straight line so that you know that up is up and down is down. Now, the same thing over this side, you can have your hand the other way up, but now it's the other way around. So you've got to understand that the way that you hold your, um, your scope will affect the picture. But I always hold it in this position like that. Now, if you're with a patient, you want to actually get really, really close to them. Because if you're doing from out here, your levers are much more difficult. So you're then moving from your your shoulders rather than from your arms and you don't really want to move from your shoulders because it's not good at the fine movement. I always tell the patient that I'm going to be really close to them for them to sit with their bum back in the chair and sitting up. Naturally people try and lean back so I'm going to try and lean back. Now that's going to make it more difficult for you. So you want the patient to be you want the patient to be sitting up. I always put my finger on top of their head and sit in an upright position, nice and neutral and then I put my finger on top of their nose. The reason I do this is because it allows me to judge while I'm looking, if I'm looking down the, with my eyepiece, if they're moving their head away with my finger, so move your head backwards, Alison, so I know they're moving away from me, so that way I've got some sort of tactile feedback. So I'm gonna put my finger on those, and then I support the, the camera with my thumb, and we'll have a look up the nose, so place it upwards. Now, initially, you want to point upwards in the nose, and then, as you can see there, as you come in, you can see the inferior turbinate, you can see a little bit of erythema there, and then straighten my arm out so I'm going down the floor of the nose. And what you can see is it's very small movements, gently passing the scope in, and I'm using my fingers just to slowly slide that in. Do you want to actually press video so that... Um, okay. Brilliant, lovely. So we're going to go down the nose, and that's the inferior turbinate to the left of the screen, the septum to the right of the screen. We're coming to the post-nasal space here, and over there we can see the eustachian tube orifice. Now what you can see is, with my um, right hand, if I twist my hand, my right hand, if I twist my hand, can you see how the picture twists? So that allows me to move left and right. And now with my finger, so using my finger here, if I push downwards on here, you can see on the camera, so if you just turn around, so you keep the, keep the camera exactly where it is, but if, on your VR headset, if you turn your head round, you can see we're going down around the corner. There's some bumpiness there at the back of the throat, so that's a little bit of erythema, uh, and then a little bit of cobblestoning of the poster. And here we can see the epiglottis. So here we're at the level of the soft pad. So I'm going to just come back a little bit. So, Alison, what I want you to do is you can sometimes get mu you can see there. There's some mucus on the back. So, Alison, I just want to say la 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 la. And can you see the soft palate there is lifting up, up here to the right. There's the um, eustachian tube of it, and that's where the adenoids would be there. So we're going to go round, round the corner and ask the patient to sniff them, breathe through your nose. We've got the epiglottis so here with the level of the soft palate, we've got our epiglottis, and we get the patient to say, e. E. and you can see the vocal cords there. We can often also ask the patient to open their mouth and stick the tongue out as far as you possibly can, try and touch your 
tongue on your chin, and you can see the patient's moving forward, and you can see how that opens out and relax. Now blow your cheeks out like you're blowing out a balloon. Good, and relax. And we go down, and a big deep sniff in, and that's the, and the piriform phosphorine inside. And then when we're coming out, we've got to also be careful. So here, we've got to control it with our finger, making sure we're not trying to touch the back walls. As we come into the face nasal space, we're changing the position. There, there's a bit of mucus on the end as you come out. We're gently trying to come out of the nose, supporting the entire way through the nose, and we're out from there. Now, it's very uncommon for patients to... Brilliant. Oh, stop recording there. That was rather uncommon.